Good afternoon. Thank you very much for remaining with us and not leaving before the last session because we are going to talk about uh, solutions and, and things we can do. So it will be good to engage in a nice discussion about what to do with the situation which as it was described in the previous panels. My name is Miriam Lexman and I'm director for programs for the International Republican Institute and I also head our EU office in Brussels. And being Central European, it's a big honor for me to to chair this panel and lead the discussion, primarily because we are going to talk about the solutions. On the other hand, being European, I don't think I could come back to Europe and say like, well, the Americans say that we should do this and this and this and we'll be right. So, <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I, I'm sure that the message will get across to Europe. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. To my left, I would like to welcome Ambassador Kurt, uh, Kurt Volker, the Executive Director of McCain Institute for International Leadership. Then to his left, I would like to welcome Nadezhda Muzikina, the Senior Program Manager for Central <coughs> Eastern Europe for the National Democratic Institute. And last but not least, I would like to welcome Mr. Karl Gershman, the President of the National Endowment for Democracy. I will start with the, with the questions and then we'll be happy to engage everyone in the discussion. And I would like to start with a question to Kurt. I mean, Kurt, you have been in the early 90s, I mean, you don't look like, but you have <laughs> been already with the State Department and, and in, involved in, uh, in Central Europe, and then later on in a senior positions in NATO in the late 90s and early 2000. And I was wondering if you could maybe come back in your thoughts to do those times and see what lessons could be learned if we knew that the situation will evolve this way then, and maybe what this lesson can, how, how this lesson can kind of indicate what needs to be done I with the situation in Central mm -hmm. Eastern Europe okay. today. Thank and uh, if I can, well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'd, I'd like to start with a broader point and then come to the question that you asked, if that's okay. Because I, I, I made a list before coming over here, uh, just thinking about the questions and the topics here. And so here's my list, uh, xenophobia, nationalism, corruption, abuse of power, inequality before the law, efforts to influence or control the judiciary for political purposes, media reflecting significant political bias or ownership controlling the message, the use of public office to drive personal or political fortunes, commingling of public and private activity, um, police crackdowns, brutality, killing or civil unrest. Those are all things we've had in the United States in the last six months. So <laughs> when we talk about this part of the world and gee, what's gone wrong, I think if we limit the question to what's going on in this part of the world in Central and Eastern Europe, we're missing the point. Because these are phenomena that are happening in our society, in Western Europe, uh, Northern Europe, in Central and Eastern Europe. It's a much broader phenomenon. And it is certainly happening in these countries. I'm not suggesting that, gee, these aren't problems. But what I'm suggesting is the problem is different than saying there's something wrong with Central Europe. Uh, there's something wrong instead with the way that uh, our governing elites in our Western-style democracies have failed to grasp and respond and address legitimate fears and concerns that publics have. And in response to that, they are hunkering down, protecting identity, and looking for you know, nativist, tribalist solutions. You know, how do we protect ourselves? Because our leaders clearly don't get it. So to get to your point, your, your question then, so what's the solution? I mean, you, you can only start talking about solutions, in my view, if, you, if you're starting with the right set of questions. And if the questions are, how are our elites dealing with our publics and the challenges of all of these issues, globalization, economy, identity, immigration, so that people are concerned about, we gotta start dealing with those. Mm -hmm. And we gotta start providing more credible solutions. Uh, if I were to make some specific suggestions about um, things that I would encourage Western governments, meaning US and EU government, or Western Europe and the US, 
I'd say the first one would be to start off with a bit of humility and self-recognition and self-awareness. We, we're all having some problems. I would say that it is particularly an issue where our own political elites are not connecting and communicating, so we've got to think about how to do a better job at that. Um, and on the Central and Eastern European side, my advice would be not to be so defensive. Um, and they go hand in hand as well, too, because in, in, when you bring these issues up with Central European governments, you often get, well, it's not so bad. Well, that's not true. It is actually pretty bad. It's just bad everywhere, not only with you. And so um, the answer is to recognize, yeah, there are problems, and we've got to figure out how we all do a better job tackling these. And then one other point that I jotted down, because I knew that question was coming, what should we have anticipated that we didn't anticipate in the 90s when we were looking at NATO and EU enlargement the first time? And I think what we didn't anticipate was the degree to which uh, money matters. So driving politics, driving corruption, uh, paying po uh, political party finance is important because if you have it, then you can run, and if you don't have it, you don't have it. So people have to figure it out, but then the means at which you figure out political party finance or issues like media ownership, the, you know, somebody's got to own these things, and oftentimes they might have a political alliance that goes right along with their ownership. Again, this is not a Central European phenomenon. Look, remember Berlusconi in Italy owned the private media while being the prime minister of the country. Uh, and look at our media. You know, we, we have the Rupert Murdoch side of the media, we have the Ted Turner side of the media. So th this is something that I just think we underestimated was the role of money in the way democratic political systems function. Um, the other is that I think we expected, uh, very naively as we, as we are wont to do, to think that you, you have a single narrative, a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the reality is there is no end. It's a constant process, and it's a process that's going to have ups and downs. And, and that's just what we have to, to live with. May I have a follow-up question? Because you have mentioned all the reasons why, why we can in general say that there is a frustration among the electorate or citizens in Central Europe as well as in, in the West in general. And you run an institute focusing on leaders. So, and I mean, coming from the region, I know that the, our leaders in the, in the 90s were all people who studied in the US got an, different fellowships. So they kind of saw the world and they could bring the expertise and the, what they learned back to in our, I mean, in our countries. And, and they, were, they were good leaders also because they have seen maybe the, the flip side of democracy. So, I mean, they had the kind of full picture. And I wonder why, I mean, I mean maybe focusing now on the democracy support, why the programs are unable now to, to identify leaders and invest in the leaders? I mean, what, what, what is different now than it was then? Um, I think when we talk about leadership in that context of you know, next generation or emerging leaders programs and connecting people and inspiring them with good values and good character and all that, uh, we're investing in the, the best nature of peoples and, and, and what we hope that they are able to lead and do. But the nature of politics in democratic societies is it's not just about what you want. You, you do try to inspire, you do try to lead, but you've also got to be responsive to what your publics are saying, what the political party environment is, what your opponents are. And I think a lot of them have grown up in that, and uh, in a, for better and worse, uh, that they've had to figure out as a matter of reality, what can we really do? Um, some of them, and I'll give you a great example that I know quite well and know him personally, is Viktor Orban in Hungary. Um, I disagree with a lot of the policy choices that he has made and is making as prime minister. I think he's, he's doing things that I don't think he ought to do. However, uh, he has done a brilliant job as a politician, uh, figuring out how to make the system work for him, building a strong political party, squashing political opponents that would have challenged that political party, that political space. Um, addressing and speaking to the population in a way that they feel like he gets it and ways that some of the other political leaders in Hungary have not been able to do. And you know, one of the, uh, a friend of mine who is also prime minister of Hungary, Gordon Bainai, he was a great technocrat. I think he did a terrific job for that year he was prime minister. 
Talk about a terrible politician. <laughs> I mean, he really could not convince anybody to vote for him. And uh, that, I think, is, is something that these leaders who we, we worked with, you know, they've had to learn over time. How do you actually function in a, in a democratic system? Thank you very much. I will now give a question to Carl. You lead one of the most distinctive fund supporting democracy support worldwide. And we see a little shift now that, that NED is focusing again more in Central Europe and especially uh, funding, funding programs which are looking at the Russian influence inside of Europe. And I wonder if, according to your analysis, that this, this uh, destructive element of the Russian influence is one of the biggest dangers for democracy in Central Europe or, or what, are the kind of relation, what is the relationship between the internal and external factors in the weak or flip side or weak sides of the democracy? Yeah, I know, that's a great question. <coughs> and look, there are very, very significant internal factors. You know, one of them is economic and globalization. Larry Summers had a good piece on that, I thought, um, on, in Monday's uh, Washington Post. Um, you have, in addition to that, you have you know, the problem of corruption, you have the problem of immigration, and then you have the demographic problem, which really, uh, I think, makes these things worse. In other words, but it, it creates a kind of a bad context for liberal values, um, and people can express their frustrations through voting. But then you have to take into account this, this Russian factor, um, because if you have a difficult or problematic context, if you have an outside force, a very important force that wants to really exploit these divisions and to do it very systematically, it can create a lot of trouble. I sometimes, when I think of Russia today, I, I think of Othello and Iago, you know, how to really get people at war with each other, and that's something that they do. We had, I think, an important conference last week here in Washington on the 80th oh. anniversary of the birth of Václav Havel. And we had some you know, really good people there, a lot of Americans, but also um, Ivan Krastev and Igor Blazovich. Blazovich um, is somebody from Bosnia, a Croat from Bosnia, who then left Bosnia with all the troubles and went to uh, Prague and worked with Havel for a long, long time. And he said something at that meeting which was very interesting to me and very troubling. He said that what he, he was in Burma for five years. Havel sent him to Burma to work with Burma. And when he returned to Prague, he said he saw in the environment, in the society, the same kind of aggressiveness that he saw in Bosnia in the early 90s. Now, where does that come from? He felt, and I think it's true when we talk about elites, that the, the elites have given the green light to a lot of people to go after minorities to go after scapegoats. That's part of the problem that we face in Europe today. So I think, you know, when you look at these external and internal factors, you can't separate them. You can't separate them here, frankly. I won't go into that, but you can't separate them here um, because they're intimately connected with each other. And I think as we think about what's the problems and then the possible solutions. I don't think you can divorce the crisis that we have today from the broader geopolitical context, a context of growing Russian assertiveness and growing US retreat. That creates a very, very difficult context. The only other thing I would say is that in the, at the meeting we had last week, the common point that ran through the discussions was people's new realization of the deep fragility of democracy. And I think when you say, what didn't we anticipate in the early 90s, there was a kind of a triumphalist view of democracy, the end of history, the inevitability of democracy, and so forth. Even though, you know, people who read Huntington on the third wave knew that reverse waves follow waves. I mean, that's just the nature of it. Now, I don't know whether we're in a real reverse wave today we debate that. The conference actually debated it. You know, are we in a recession, like Larry Diamond says, or a real depression? I mean, that's a good question. You know, they were saying, and maybe I should say this, um, on a great day when Bob Dylan got the uh, Nobel Prize for, liter for Literature, that one of the comments made, 
if, you know, if you're debating this, whether it's dark or darkening, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, long live Dylan. Uh, but it, it, it's, a, it's a time, you know, when, um, when people n uh, newly appreciate that liberal democracy is not the inevitable, not the wave of the future. It's extremely difficult to build liberal democracy. And when you have problems such as you have today, economic globalization, immigration, demographics, and don't underestimate demographics. It's really critical to the mentality in Europe and the geopolitical context. Um, it's extremely hard to defend liberal values. And so going forward, this is what we have to think about. And one way to start thinking about this, I think, is for us here. You know, we have to get our own act together. We have to realize that our own democracies are in trouble. That was a common view that the homeland of democracy, the United States and Europe, is in trouble today. OK, we have to recognize that. But we also have to start thinking seriously as adults in a mature way about the geopolitical context. And the idea of just being able to affirm values and principles without putting any meaningful uh, force and power behind it is ridiculous. And we have to start thinking about that and, and learning some lessons from the past period. Uh, we have been talking about, in the previous panel, someone has mentioned that, 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 that it's interesting that, that the Central European countries, mainly, I mean, the EU member state from Central Eastern part of, of Europe, I mean, they have profited, I mean, grandly from being member of the EU. But the EU is unable to communicate this to them as well that their leaders are having two different messages. I mean, at, at home, they're putting all the blame on Europe. So people practically do not know what Europe has brought or EU has brought to, these, to their daily lives. And then they see only the negative parts. And I wonder if, if you, I mean, and we also know at the same time that social media where, I mean, most of the people and more and more people are getting all the information from social media, not from the mainstream media. We, where the kind of geopolitical war, I would say, that is more extensive. I mean, you have people in Slovakia dealing with, with problems in Syria and discussing, I mean, Russia and the US in Syria instead of discussing their ordinary lives because they are so frustrated. They don't know what solution is to their future, to their job, and they, the, the whole situation is so complex. So they, they kind of discuss something which they can not influence at all, or very, very little influence over. And I wonder, what, what do you believe? What, what should be the messaging, or what should be do differently that people do understand that we are on the winning side? I mean, that, that, that being part of the West is the being part of the best part of the world, and not the, the worst part, as many people have this, this in, impression. I mean, the, the polling in the US and in Europe is showing that people are still believing that the crisis is still on, that we, we are not, that the numbers and um, the economic numbers are not improving and, and the reality is different. So what, where are we failing to communicate this to, to the people? What do you believe? Well, like one of the points that Krostev was making, that if the European Union is seen as um, an institution to defend the interests of the elites, it's going to be in deep trouble and it won't survive. In other words, and this goes for our country as well as Europe, and this is one of the points of Summer's, I thought, rather interesting piece on Monday, is that we have to shift our thinking on these issues from thinking about capital and austerity measures and so forth to uh, thinking about workers, labor, investment, uh, how to you know, create jobs, and really show that this is the, uh, the focal point um, of policy. Also, from the point of the EU, I mean, this is something that uh, you know, that the EU is going to have to deal with, but are they going to really take Article 7 of the EU treaty seriously and the respect for common values and really, you know, we have to do that in our hemisphere, you know, with, with the democratic charter. But, you know, this is something that the EU is going to have to think uh, very, very seriously about. And then I think that we're at a point, and this, is, again, is an issue that came up last week at the, at the Havel conference, it's complicated, but we have to do two things intellectually. On the one hand, we have to affirm first principles because they're lost. They're lost everywhere. They're lost here. Nobody talks about what we're about as a country anymore, what we stand for, uh, universal values and so forth. And it's necessary to affirm first principles 
and to do it, but to do it in a way that addresses contemporary issues and problems. I mean, the first principles don't change, but the context changes, and you now have issues of globalization and alienation and elites and so forth. And we're going to have to think about how to do that. And we've been toying with an idea that I think is important to, uh, you know, we're, we're discussing it with people, uh, but it's important, I think, to go forward. And that is maybe, uh, it's more than a transatlantic idea. It's a global idea. But to um, re recreate a global association of people who think about these issues, like the old Congress for Cultural Freedom, and call it something like the Congress for Democratic Renewal. But people are you know, going to have to come together, think, and, and have a forum where people can really think hard about um, how to project a new perspective and just don't rely upon you know, the past, but project a new perspective, but a perspective that is based upon fundamental first principles that need to be reaffirmed and that everyone here and in Europe seems to have forgotten. Mm. But I, I don't want to keep long because we have other topics to cover, but this is very interesting, interesting idea of, of this kind of council, but who should be there? Because the leaders who are discussing it mainly are, are I mean, are losing trust of the of, yeah, of the, the, leaders. Of the I mean, populations. Not the and then as, as Kurt said before, I yeah. mean, we have populist leaders who are exploiting mm -hmm. the, the kind of differences, how people think, bit, I mean, the right. big gap between the leaders and, 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 and the general population. So who would be in this body? I mean, right how, now, I mean, the, just, just this is an, an idea, idea obviously meant to influence the leaders, and in, but mm -hmm. also to influence the populations and to influence that argument um, and to begin to make the case for democracy and, and democratic values. It's a difficult time to do it because of all the problems, you know, when there are other problems that we've discussed, you know, the fact that people are feeling very, very unhappy today and that unhappiness is being exploited. I think it would help if you had, um, you know, a stronger, uh, if, if the U.S. made very clear that it's engaged with Europe and Central Europe, that it's going to defend these values, that uh, we believe that the transatlantic relationship is absolutely essential. Um, but I think there's a real job to be done um, by people who think independently about these problems in terms of formulating ideas and perspectives and to really shaping the discussion. Because right now the discussion is being shaped by the most aggressive people. And, you know, I don't know how you do this, but moderate people have to learn how to become intellectually assertive. You know, it's not that difficult, but it's difficult if, if you don't really know what you believe in. That's true. Thank you very much. Nadia, uh, without, I mean, I think we, we understand the large context and, and you work with uh, mainly with civil society and political parties in Central Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. And maybe kind of like if you could maybe bring us the picture of the larger Central Eastern Europe, because I think we are kind of like in the previous panels, we are focusing on the Central European yes. countries, but maybe we should look also a little bit more on the Balkans sure. and the Eastern Partnership, as we call the the post-Soviet, uh, six post-Soviet states in, in Europe. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more what, I mean, from your daily work, uh, what do you think are the kind of weak parts of the connection between the political parties, the citizens and the governments? I mean, where, where, where are the weak parts, where we have failed maybe in the support and what needs to be done differently in order to kind of strengthen the, the triangle that it, it's working? Sure, thank you very much, Miriam. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here on such a distinguished panel. Um, I think when we're talking about the overall picture, and, and, I, and as you mentioned, it's not just the Vis Visegrad countries, it, it spans the larger gamut of, of Central and Eastern Europe and beyond. Um, we're, we're looking at three, three things. The, the state of, of sort of apathy this, and, and the state of civil society, um, the state of the opposition parties and the political systems in that sense, and then the larger relationship and, and the interplay between the government, the political parties, and, and the citizens and civil society. And, and I'm distinguishing a little bit between citizens and civil society, and that is one of the key issues um, that we're seeing, is that um, civil society groups are not necessarily seen as representatives of citizen interests, and, and that is one area that, um, that we're looking at right now. Um, the space for civil society arguably is 
better in some countries than others. It's, it's definitely closing, um, closing probably even more in, in the Visegrad countries as we're seeing, particularly Hungary. Um, but civil society is still there. It's still kicking. Uh, civic organizations are springing up, but it's not necessarily in what we would say the traditional medium of civil society, um, not just organizations. So you're seeing groups like COD which was mentioned in the first panel, uh, the uh, Committee for the Defense of Democracy in Poland. Uh, but that you're, see, you're seeing also tradi more traditional groups like the Center for Free Elections and Democracy in Serbia that are still thriving. The problem is the, the more typical civil society organizations are becoming less and less and these grassroots, sort of not centralized, disorganized people protest movements are what we're really seeing emerge across the region, sort of the Occupy Wall Street type movements. And that is actually sort of what COD also is doing. It, it's not a centralized group and, and they're going out there and it's the same that we've seen in Macedonia with the Protestira movement in response to the recent events. It's these grassroots revolutions. Um, they're not necessarily organized, they're not necessarily presenting policy alternatives, but they're speaking out. So the good thing is that despite the apathy that you're seeing across the region and people not participating, when it comes to matters that affect their daily lives, people are speaking out. And we saw that, like I said, recently in Macedonia, we saw that in Bulgaria, uh, when the electricity prices were going up, we saw that in Hungary when they were talking about, um, I think it was the, the internet text that was raising. So people are coming out on issues that are very important to them and making it clear that they're not okay with these policies. So the fact that, uh, you can still raise citizen interest on these issues, that's very critical. Um, one big issue is that uh, the traditional citizen organization or, or NGOs, if you want to call them, um, lack sustainability and there's a lot of different interests. They're vying for very small pots of money from the same sources and that's largely because when EU and when the US came in in the early 90s, there was a lot of money given to citizen organizations, but there was very little done to teach them how to sustain themselves once the money comes out. And we're seeing that more and more in, in Central Europe, uh, largely uh, west of, of, of the former Soviet Union, the Visegrad countries are a great example where the, the traditional civil society groups are kind of dying out because they're vying for the same small resources. And because they're doing that, even groups that are representing the same interest but from maybe a different perspective, for instance, take disability organizations. If you're a cross-disability group versus a group that focuses on the blind, for instance, or the, you know, the handicapped, they're, they're not gonna work together because there's only one pot of money and it doesn't serve them well to uh, come together and, and, and go for that money together. Um, the other problem that we're seeing is that people don't trust civil society groups. Uh, there, and that goes back to, to education that we were also talking about in, in earlier panels. There's lack of understanding what civil society does and who NGOs are. And when you don't have the support of the people or the people look at you as uh, representing the interests of the government or you know, a government agency, they're not going to come out and support your efforts even if they are trying to truly represent uh, your opinion. The fact that there is a lack of political balance in Central and Eastern Europe between the opposition and mainstream parties is also a big issue. And whereas before you saw uh, this you know, West versus East discourse, um, and that has disappeared over time, which to all of us working in, in, in this region in particular uh, was seen as a sign of progress when it was all, all right, well, the parties are not really vying for East versus West, but more we're all pro-Europe. It's just how we look at it is a little different. Um, the issue is sort of rearing its ugly head again, uh, but it's in a different context now. It's not necessarily pro-West versus pro-East, but it's more about pro-EU and Western values as opposed to traditional values and identity. And I think that was also discussed a little bit in, in earlier sessions. It's about what are we as a country, are we losing our identity? And this is where the rise of populism and nationalism comes in. And the other issue is that there is such a disbalance in, in the political parties and the political systems that uh, the opposition, unless, uh, unless they unite, have basically no chance of standing against the larger mainstream parties that continue gathering momentum. And in most of the countries, whether it's in the Visegrad countries or in the prospective member states, you know, the Serbias, the Macedonians, the opposition is so fragmented and fractured. 
and because there's a disconnect between parties and civil society groups that could potentially support them, you're not really going to see the opposition making any progress, not even during elections. And we've seen failure over and over again in the last rounds, no matter which country you look at. And because there's a lack of credible opposition parties, civil society has sort of stepped in, in some cases, to be the voice, that opposition voice, that, that proposes different policy alternatives. And that is not exactly the right role. I mean, they, there should be groups working on certain interests, but civil society should not be playing the role of a political party. That, that is not a good connection to have. And because civil society is often playing that opposition role, there's lack of government trust for the opposition and they see them as a threat. And this is where we've seen the backlash in a lot of the countries in Central and Eastern Europe. You know, the, the favoritism, for instance, among how groups are funded by government funds, you know, the, the I guess the similar discourse that we've seen in Russia in terms of, um, in terms of foreign funding that we saw with the Norwegian funds in, in Hungary, for instance, you know, that is a threat that was seen as a threat that those countries were bringing in ideologies that were not okay. Um, and so I think there's a lot of different channels that are going that we need to be studying closely because whereas we were training for many years your standard traditional NGOs, but without sustainability, without support, and without um, a good political system that allows opposition parties to also rise up and provide policy alternatives and connection between opposition parties and civil society groups in fighting for the same uh, values, um, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of problems. But on a positive note, as I said, you are seeing a resurgence of citizen interest, and I think that is really important to capitalize on. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I will, I will elaborate a little bit more on the political parties issues because the, l I mean, being in Brussels and engaging with the European support to democracy, I mean, we're always discussing the support to political parties because it's mainly US donors working with political parties and the EU donors are mainly focusing on civil society. Mm -hmm. And then kind of saying like, yes, maybe we should start to work with the parties, but they, they're so weak, they don't do anything and they are so fragmented. So it, it makes no point. And, and the argument is it actually makes point because, the, because then the NGOs cannot run. So right. obviously it's an in vicious yeah. circle. I mean, the parties will remain weak and weak, weak vis-a-vis the civil society, mm -hmm. the NGOs, which kind of creates lots of, lots of uh, tensions or imbalance in the society, which nev inevitably doesn't lead into a kind of strong and healthy democracy. So this is, I mean, I believe as well that, that the support to political parties in Ukraine, in Moldova, in the Balkans, is absolutely vital absolutely. for having a healthy relationship between the NGOs and the political parties, and then vis-a-vis -vis governments as, as well. But I would like to ask you and, and all of you, well, one element you, you Nadia, has, ha, have mentioned is the, because you said that, that it looks like from the, from the citizens' point of view that their traditional values are being attacked or that there is a tension between their traditional values and the EU institutions mm -hmm. and the West. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that this is one of the, kind, one of the uh, deepest um, gap in our democracy and, and I think we actually have a problem to close this gap and, 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 it's, and we don't talk about it because we have the liberal circles, I mean, I mean socially liberal because the Europeans are using this word in a different way. Uh, we have the socially liberal circles and, 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 and socially conservative circles and I, I think that I mean, they less and less talk to each other and, and, and I also believe that this is one of the deepest gap Russia is exploiting. Mm -hmm. uh, working with, with the socially conservative people, I mean, addressing them directly, having lots of organizations they support. But then the question is, how do we, I mean, how can we, how can the West still support the civil society when, when obviously, I mean, the different donors have different opinions on this, and then it's very clearly, I mean, it, it, it brings these tensions into the society and the kind of imbalance in the society, because in, the, in, in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Moldova, they know that where the donor stands on, on these issues more or less. Mm -hmm. So that's why, I mean, it creates lots of tensions, and also, I mean, we can, we can ask the questions, like we don't like Russians uh, supporting NGOs and, and infrastructure or businesses in our part of the world, so how do we justify our interventions in, in, this, in democracies and in, in Central Eastern Europe. 
And, and maybe I will bring one more element into this question is the social media. Because with social media, we can accelerate or, or an activity of a small group of people can be really accelerated in such great extent that it can change the political balance in the country. So practically that also gives the donors enormous power to influence uh, the political structures in a, thank you, I'm losing everything, the political structures, influence the political structures in, in, a, in a small stage, where, states where, where even small money can, can have a large influence. So how do we justify our, our support to democracy and then, then we are not creating deeper uh, gaps but we are actually putting the society more together and, and creating healthy relationships? Um, if I may, um, I think one of the ways that we've seen um, some success is by bringing all the, uh, all the key players together. What I mean by that is by bringing the human rights groups, the uh, pro-economy or economic expansion groups, the political parties, the government institution, everyone together to understand what their interests are. Because there's such a disconnect, you know, there's, uh, civil society is often looking at the political space as something they don't want to answer, uh, enter, but that is the, the opposite of what we need them to do. Because if you're a true advocate, you're going to need to advocate for your interests in the political space. And so actually, um, as we've been discussing in recent months, sort of this, where did we go wrong in, in this civil society support? And that is not, strengthening the links between the government and political parties and civil society. You need to find entry points within the government. You need to, and, and you need to expose them to what the civil society is actually doing. So that's one point. Um, so basically, for instance, if you're looking at um, LGBT groups, uh, for instance, we, we, did, uh, we did a lot of um, surveys on this in Serbia, uh, where we've been working uh, on LGBT rights for the past five years. And one thing we found out, for instance, that there's a lot of support from, for instance, women's organizations, women MPs. So if you're starting to link them with groups that are supporters, you're going to get more traction on getting these issues to be seen as more normal. Um, visibility, exposure, understanding, education. Uh, if you're looking at uh, refugees, Roma, other marginalized populations, again, it's exposure, it's education. It's not vilifying them like the governments have been doing. The governments have a very big role to play in, in how they talk about civil society organizations, how they talk about marginalized groups, how they talk about human rights groups. If they're using language that people are hearing and saying, oh, okay, well, you know, the, the prime minister said that, that they're scum, that they're bad, that means they probably are. So there's a lot of education and, and use of media and, and, and journalism as well that needs to be used in how do you portray all these groups and, and all these issues. Um, but I think, um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought for a little bit. But I think with, with social media, I think that is one key way of getting at the, at, the, at the younger generation. But again, you face the problem of what media are they going to be using and what media are they going to believe and what channels and who are they going to believe because right now there's very big just disillusionment across the board. Thank you. Carl, or well, Carl, look, would you like? I, you know, I think when you, speak too much about donors and their policies, you get very, very parochial and you lose the larger picture. And I think it's important to keep the larger picture in mind. It's not just our work, our business, but it's a, a much larger phenomenon here. And I think what's necessary to do now is to find some new reconciliation between democracy and nationalism. Um, the elites are associated with globalization with the EU, the donors are associated with globalization with the EU. And therefore, it's very easy to lose contact, especially at a time when people are unhappy with uh, the way these larger uh, institutions are working. It's very possible to, to, to lose contact with them and to open the way up for Russia and others to kind of manipulate what Leszek Kolakowski once called malignant nationalism. There is malignant nationalism and there is benign nationalism. There's nothing wrong with benign nationalism. And if the EU takes the view that we gotta get beyond all nationalism, that all nationalism is somehow primitive and corrupt, you're gonna lose the battle. Uh, and they have to find a way to reconcile our concept of democracy with national tradition um, and uh, national identity. Uh, and it, we should not allow those two things to become counterposed to each other. There's a uh, Georgian 
intellectual by the name of Guillen Odia, who is now a fellow at NED in Washington. And I let you know that in a month, he's going to be giving the Seymour Martin Lipset Democracy Lecture on the issue of the crisis of post-nationalism, which we're in today. In other words, people said nationalism was going to disappear with all these modern forces, but it hasn't. Uh, nationalism is returning, but the question is, what kind of nationalism? Um, and I think we have to give a lot of thought to that and not give that issue to Putin. And by the way, maybe one last point, since we're, uh, you know, we're talking gloom and doom here. Um, you know, Georgia just had an election, and it was a pretty good election, and it was a democratic election. And a lot of people in this town thought, you know, that when the Saakashvili party lost, that it was going to, you know, great gain for Russia. That hasn't been that way. The Georgian people are overwhelmingly for Europe, for democracy, and that was affirmed in this recent election. And similarly in Ukraine, we just had a program officer who returned from Mariupol. And, you know, the basic, you know, conclusion that he brought back from his visit to Mariupol, which if you remember was a target of the separatists and Putin, is that it has backfired on Putin. And that one of the things Putin has done by Russian aggression has been to stimulate the creation of a real nationalism in Ukraine, a nationalism that is going to oppose Soviet imperialism. That's a good thing. The Russians will say it's Nazi-like and so forth. That's their propaganda. But let us affirm these values and not give in to uh, the Putin propaganda. If I can add a couple thoughts on this. Um, one of them is there's a, oftentimes a presumption in the question that you asked, that there's this gap between the, uh, the liberal democratic elites and the values espoused by people and what populations are responding to. And therefore, the populations have to be educated and have to change. And I think we have to actually flip it. So wait a second. Maybe the elites are actually a minority. Uh, maybe they are actually leading edge on some of these issues, as opposed to where the majority of the public attitudes are. And maybe they need to change a bit. So I think that um, that's one aspect I would highlight. And, and that was partly what Carl was saying about the or nationaliz nationalism as well. Let's that, become a little popular. Yeah, become a little popular. <laughs> Let's become a little, be open to a little bit more nationalism. And it's not just the, na you chose nationalism as an example, but it's true on economics, it's true on social issues, it's true on um, uh, religious issues at times. There's a whole range of things where people feel their identities are under uh, attack. The second thing I would do as part of your focus on recommendations is we really have to be careful to distinguish between democratic institutions and policy choices within a democracy. Uh, it's important to stand up for the institutions and make sure that they're fair. But then we also, as you know, liberal elites uh, running foreign policy or whatever else, recognize that people may make choices in those systems that we don't like. But that's legitimate, <laughs> that they have the right to make those choices. And it may not be what I would want, um, but it might be what is a democratic outcome. And the third thing is, I think rather than you gave the example of the American uh, donors supporting political parties and the European ones supporting civil society groups, it's very difficult to work with the political parties. Um, Rather than viewing it that we have to support a particular political view or set of political parties and oppose others or particular views within civil society, uh, that's a very uh, intrusive thing to do. And in our own country, we would rebel against that. Uh, so I think a better way to think of it, and especially at a European level, might be to try to replicate at a European level what Germany does very well at a national level, which has a Stiftung for every party. <laughs> and they all get to engage, and they get to have relationships. And it's not, um, it's not seen as unfair, because there's something there. You know, there's a diversity of engagement. You're creating competition, as opposed to trying to put a finger on the scale. Thank you very much. I, I have a lot of further questions, but I know that the audience probably has questions too. So I will give up on mine, and I hope that someone is going to bring up those questions which are in my, in my mind. So I'll open a, for, 
the floor to the first round of questions. So, gentlemen over there. Uh, Dick Rosen with the Community of Democracies. Uh, there has been an expression of need to support institutions that would advance the values that we hold as dear to democracy. I have two, and I'd like to ask a question about th these two institutions as the panel sees it. The first is an institution that would strengthen the Atlantic community, which Carl Geschman called for. Uh, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, is not simply an economic suggestion. It is an organization which, if created, would provide a greater political unity and could be also a voice for jobs and growth, which have been essential in the discussions we had earlier. Secondly, uh, Carl has called for a meeting of democracies to talk about a redefinition of our values. There is an institution uh, which was mentioned by Madeleine Albright at the NED meeting, the Community of Democracies, which he conceived in the year 2000. Is that organization another that could be revitalized and could be used to help redefine the values that we stand for uh, in democracy? Thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can pick up a few questions, and then I will give the floor to all panelists to respond. So there was another gentleman just next to you. Uh, I'd like to comment and to Franek Richorka, Radio for Europe. I'd like to comment and to ask a question. Uh, first comment was about nationalism. Actually, I really, really impressed what Karl Geschman said because uh, a few years ago uh, we had discussion with net people you know, about nationalism and the American um, uh, donors, they usually were afraid of nationalism as a eurosceptical and anti-democratic. But now we have seen that nationalism in Russia, Hungary and Poland, it's absolutely different thing uh, than nationalism in Ukraine or Belarus. Because in Belarus or Ukraine, nationalism is very inclusive, usually inclusive, pro-European, and it works a, as antidote to neo-imperialism. And for example, now this re re revival of civil society, it happens thankful to this national identity feelings. But my question is uh, about, um, uh, you know, this concept of sons, sons of the beach. Uh, you know, uh, the Western uh, countries, they believe that, you know, facing Russian uh, invasion to Ukraine, neo-imperialism, you know, Putin's, uh, power, uh, Putin's power, they started to cooperate or to find a way to cooperate with dictators. Azerbaijan, Lukashenko in Belarus, other countries. So the question is, does this concept um, uh, really exist? And does it work? You know, so yes, he is... Uh, son of a bitch, but he is our son of a bitch. <laughs> That's a question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Is there a third question or we will... Thank you. Um, I heard a lot about uh, speaking about uh, traditional values uh, in this panel. Uh, my question is, do you agree or disagree or do you think that there are differences big differences or big similarities between the traditional values in this region, the Central uh, Eastern European region, in comparison to the Western uh, part. And I would like to ask also a question, maybe somebody can comment here, on the role of the religious institutions playing uh, uh, in this process of civil society uh, building, just considering that there's a difference in values, religious values, religious ideologies in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have three themes, TTIP, uh, nationalism and our leader versus their leader, and traditional values and religious institutions. So who would like to address at least, uh, you don't need to address all the questions, but at least some of them. You c well, I'm a liberal uh, on, leader, on you can TTIP, pick up which look, one you want. Uh, this is an idea that's in trouble today, but um, uh, I think that Working on, in, in, you know, working on trade agreements today, you've got to show that those agreements can work for common people. And just don't assume that the rising tide lifts everybody. It has to be focused, and there are, have to work in provisions that can really you know, defend people against dumping, defend people against all the things that they feel are f affecting their jobs. On the uh, community of democracies, um, 
I wasn't calling for an association of democracies. I was calling for an association of thinkers and intellectuals and people of ideas. Um, the community of democracies has existed for 16 years where it has, you know, had dif it's an association of governments. It's had difficulty projecting strong points of view because of the need for consensus. Um, we're now working with the community and creating a new parliamentary coalition of the community, which I think will, because it's parliaments, not governments, it'll be a coalition, I think can begin to take more uh, associated with the community, but not speaking for the community, can take more forceful, uh, can take more forceful positions. On the question about, you know, Putin, I'll call him Putin and not son of a bitch for uh, <laughs> using your words. I think it's important for people to realize that the problem, to think about this, that the problem began right at the beginning. In other words, in September 1999, when Putin came to power, exploiting anti-Chechen panic by the apartment bombings and so forth. Think about it. The problem began then. And frankly, everything that's happened since then um, is predictable. And the, the West will have to think very hard about that. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll just leave it at that and go to the uh, uh, the third point about the traditional values and religion. Um, I think it's a bi another part of what I was saying before, that it's a big mistake for Western elites to assume that all religion is bad for democracy. Pope John Paul II was not bad for democracy. The Ukrainian Catholic University is not only not bad for democracy, but it's the most creative institution in Ukraine that is trying to create a new generation of people with new thinking um, and, you know, there has to be a better dialogue with the Orthodox Church, which is, the Russian Orthodox Church is an agent arm of the Russian government, but there are different voices in Orthodoxy. The, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is divided, and I think in all of these faiths and religions, there are people who, and voices that feel that democracy is essential to freedom of conscience, to freedom of religion. Um, and I think we have to start with a view that religion, which is based upon the idea of the dignity of the individual, that's where it comes from. Czeslav Milos once said, you know, if you lose the foundation, you may lose the values in the end. Kolakowski became increasingly interested in the importance of religion for democratic values and felt that if you lost religion, it would, it would mean really death a, a crisis in, for civilization. And Havel, you know, if you read Havel closely, he kept talking about the transcendental anchor. He understood that it was not enough just to have these secular processes. People are more complex than that. They're deeper than that. And it would be a big mistake, in my view, for the Western elites to start with the elitist attitude that we have all the answers, and the answers are getting beyond religion and getting beyond nationalism. There are other ways of looking at these problems. Maybe I can just follow up on, on Carl's point on religion. I think religious groups are extremely important uh, to promoting democracy and actually play a very key role. The point is which religious groups we're talking about because there are some religious groups that actually isolate other religions and, that is, and, and, and you know, isolate certain groups in the society and that is not what we're looking for. Um, in fact, right now, NDI is actually launching a program or started to launch a program in uh, the Visegrad countries that is bringing together different religious groups the Muslim groups, the um, uh, Jewish groups, uh, Christian groups, with other organizations to fight xenophobia um, and extremism. Because you have to have the equality of all citizens as first and foremost, the human right, your basic human right upheld, and religious institutions can play a huge role in bridging that, that gap. Thank you. Cool. I'll just address a couple of points quickly. One of them, uh, differences between Central and Eastern Europe versus Western Europe on values, I really don't think so. Um, the difference is that we've had political parties get elected in Central and Eastern Europe, where in Western Europe those parties have not yet been elected. Uh, Front National, Alliance for Deutschland, Sweden Democrats, uh, UK Independence Party, and, and so on. I, I think they're all, it's there across the board. Second, um, TTIP is a great example of what, uh, what we've been talking about here. Because elites will tell you it's overall better for everybody. 
It's going to create economic growth. It's going to create more jobs. It's, it's going to be a better economic and, and liberal order for everyone. But 70% of Germans are against it. French government is against it. <clears throat> a lot of Americans are against it. And it comes down to these identity issues again. How many Germans trust the FDA to tell them the food they're eating is OK? They're not going to do it. They want somebody in Germany to certify that the food they're eating is OK. Um, how many Americans taking a drug and then getting sick from it will be reassured when they were told, well, somebody in Brussels approved it? No. <laughs> we want the FDA to uh, tell us that this drug is, or, or th this drug is OK. Uh, and it, it's all these regulatory and uh, consumer protection uh, issues, data protection, data privacy, uh, where our cultures uh, are different and our, our citizens want accountability with an entity that they feel they can relate to. Also, when you get to Carl's point about TTIP, overall, yes, GDP goes up in both the United States and Europe. Yes, job creation goes up in both the US and Europe. But by state and by sector, there are some very damaging outcomes. For instance, in the automobile industry, if you were to have TTIP enacted, you would have US automobile makers in Michigan making more money and employing fewer people. And so publics and politicians are going to say, why do I want the automakers to make more money and we all lose jobs? This doesn't sound like a good idea. Uh, so these are the sorts of things where I think TTIP is a great example of this disconnect mm -hmm. between what elites think is a great idea and what publics think is a good idea. Thank you very much. I saw some more hands, and we have about 10 minutes. So either we go for very, very brief questions, and then we can cover all, if, if you all agree. So Mark, please keep it brief. Uh. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, Mark Schleifer from SIPE. Just to follow up on the point that uh, Ambassador Volker made about um, how people might make choices that we, we don't like, but we have to support their right to choose them. Uh, how, uh, my question, I guess, is about calibration or balance. You know, how does that fit with uh, the points that Carl was making about supporting a benign nationalism? You know, how do we, you know, how do we sort of flag when that nationalism or those choices go too far, and what are the mechanisms to rein those in? Hello, I'm Vanilla from St. Petersburg State University. I have a question for uh, maybe Nadezhda <laughs> Mutkina. Um, I, I wanted to follow on what you said about getting all the parties to the table. And I was thinking about what do you think? I mean, while listening to you guys at this conference, I kind of have the feeling that all hope for further cooperation is just there. But I kind of want to believe that is there not a way that European Union could find um, compromises with Russia, especially in this part of the ex-Soviet Union countries, in Moldavia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, and is there not maybe a strategy or a solution to just move all the events and the dissensions and include and integrate the problems of the ethnicities, you know, that we have in Ukraine? Is there, like, any prospect for further integration and cooperation, or is it just, like, I don't know. I kind of hope that it can be like this, maybe, maybe through institutional, institutionalized, what? Institutionalized cooperation. It can be maybe possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another hand over there and two more. If, if you could please keep it brief. Yeah. Uh, Iris Strauss. Um, I like very much what Carl said about recognizing geopolitical context and tying values with force or else we're not serious and we're not grown up. Uh, I would like to build on what Carl, Carl and Carl, uh, Kurt and Carl said about not demonizing uh, things that the people are thinking and that the elites haven't been thinking. The elites have certainly been good at demonizing the people as a basket of deplorables uh, in many parts of the world. Um, 
But I think that to, to distinguish good nationalism and bad nationalism may simplify, or good populism bad. Surely there are benign and malign aspects in every nationalism. It's a question of the balance, the location, the particular time in use, not a, an absolute in one or the other way. And there I think some qualification could be put on the polemic with international institutions. Surely the idea of the European Union and NATO and other institutions was to enable nations to govern themselves more effectively by taking away the chaos in their mutual relations that had prevented them from governing themselves democratically and effectively. And surely they've been tremendously successful, even if that isn't greatly appreciated at this moment so much. So I would think that a somewhat different way of formulating those things might be more helpful in dealing with that. And if I may, one other thing, who we are, as Carl asked. Well, Samuel Huntington answered that in a book by that title, that we are a concrete society that evolved for a thousand years out of medieval England. Uh, we are not a set of principles, we have principles. They happen to be the same principles everyone has, but a somewhat different balance of priorities, somewhat different strategies of realizing them, and far more success in realizing them through our thousand years of evolution than most other societies have had. It seems to me that that's what gives a concrete role to the benign part of our nationalism and our power, but it's a very concrete perspective thing of who we are and the role that we can play rather than an abstract value thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. And the last two questions. There was a gentleman in the back, no? Okay, there is a hand here. Sorry. There is a Hi, uh, my name is Jack Kropansky, an unaffiliated local citizen. A uh, simple question about Georgia and Ukraine. Um, is there anything concrete that we can do in the relatively short-term future t that would help them leapfrog ahead rather than have them struggle, which is what they kind of, that seems to be the model we have today, where people have to struggle a lot as opposed to some things they could do over five years to kind of leapfrog. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping it brief. I won't summarize the questions, but I will give the floor to the panelists, maybe to pick up some of the questions and maybe to, to also merge it with your final remarks because we are running a little bit out of time. So I give the floor to you. Uh, who okay. wants to start, maybe? Where do you want to start? Yeah, yeah. Where, yeah. If, okay. if, if whoever is ready. Right. <laughs> um, maybe start with leapfrogging. You know, I'm not a big leapfrogger. Uh, I believe in struggle. And I believe that uh, democracy takes a long time. And I think Ukraine and Georgia are doing well. I'd like to see the US do more to help Ukraine defend itself against foreign aggression. Obviously, Ukraine has to do a lot more to deal with the problems of corruption. Um, and there, I would only say that even that is really difficult. If you read Svetlana Alexievich, the previous Nobel laureate. <laughs> I like both of them, by the way. Um, but if you look at what she wrote about Homo Sovieticus, the way this system of communism created a mentality, getting rid of that is not easy, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to have to be done. Um, on your calibration, just look, we're for liberal democracy. I'm for liberal nationalism. I mean, it's defending the fundamental principles that are in the Universal Declaration, our Bill of Rights, all of those things that are not in contradiction with, uh, um, with nationalism, but that's the core, that's where the dividing line comes. On the issue of um, that I Ira's, uh, and Ira, it's good to see you again, um, the issue of um, uh, the, uh, what was it, on, on national, uh, national identity versus these international principles, I would just, suggest that people take a look at the writings of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, especially The Dignity of Diversity, the book The Dignity of Diversity. There is no contradiction between a unique identity of a people, of a country, and universal principles. In fact, if you try to separate the concrete identity from the universal principles, you're going to get very, very watered down universal principles that have no relationship to the concrete reality in which people live. And finally, on the issue of um, uh, Russia, and I guess it was looking for some kind of a settlement with Russia and so forth, you know, there is the Budapest Agreement, there is the Minsk Agreement. Let those agreements be respected. And, you know, the fundamental point about those agreements is get the foreign troops out. 
Uh, and the international community has been woefully inadequate in respecting those agreements uh, and in helping Ukraine defend its national integrity against foreign aggression. And if Ukraine is able to succeed on the two fronts that it is now uh, fighting, both the external threat and the internal threat of corruption, if Ukraine can succeed, that will do more in the long run, long run, for democracy in Russia than anything else. To have a neighboring country with a Slavic country where many people speak Russian, to, to have them speaking Russian freely will create a model that I think would be very, very powerful uh, for Russia. Um, I am go just going to pick up a little bit on what uh, Carl said. I don't know that I can give a better answer than he gave in terms of what, what can be done, uh, but I do agree that uh, the European Union in particular could and should be doing more. Um, and on that note, actually, speaking a little bit to your point, Mark, um, democratic institutions must absolutely be upheld, and we do need to recognize that the choices that people are making through the democratic process may not be what we like, but I think one of the key points is that we note when those choices lead to further democratic decline. You know, using democratic power to get into the government, you know, democratic elections and such, but then changing constitutions, uh, almost unilaterally changing how the court systems work and undermining democracy in that way through democratic institutions should only be tolerated so far. And that is really setting a horrible precedent what's happening in the, in the Visegrad countries in particular um, and, and in the West because if you're looking at the aspirants, if you're looking at the Serbias, the Macedonias, the Bosnias, they're now looking at, okay, well, you know, if we're on the EU path, we're gonna check off all the boxes like all those countries did before us, but we're gonna look at what can we get away with, you know, because once, you know, we see that once we're in the EU, we're just gonna get our hands slapped if we might just do something wrong because there's no actual, you know, enforcement of anything once, uh, seemingly, once you're in the EU, if you're looking from outside the European Union. So what's the incentive? Well, uh, thanks, yeah, I'll, I'll offer a couple of closing thoughts too. Uh, so first off, I agree with Carl on Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, I don't think there's a magic leapfrog. I do, however, think both the US and Western Europe need to do a, an awful lot more to keep out the vision that these are democracies, market economies, and they have every right to the same degree of security and development and prosperity as anybody else in Europe, whether it's Germany or Italy or the Netherlands, it's no difference. So that vision has to be out there um, because that's what will inspire them to actually get through the struggle. They have to struggle, but you've got to keep the vision out there. The um, second thing I would say, and it touches on a lot of the other questions, it's important, you know, how do you draw the distinction between you know, when nationalism goes too far or when something else goes too far? It's got to be, what you said, protecting the institutions, that institutions have to guarantee rights of majorities and minorities. You have to institutionalize respect within society and equality before the law. Those things need to be protected. Then people can argue and compete and have really nasty, ugly, awful free speech. <laughs> but you, you, you create these institutional and uh, legal protections. And I wanted to come back to a question from the previous round that I wanted to address in it, the SOB question. Um, I understood the question slightly differently than Carl did. Uh, the way I understood it is are we pushing countries so much on democracy and not willing to deal with countries that may not be democracies, but that we ought to be dealing with because there are big, important strategic interests in doing that? And the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, I think that, and I'll get, I'll, um, um, I, I, wanna, I don't want to name the country, but let's take an example of a country I have in mind, <laughs> which is, we have uh, a country that has gone the wrong direction on democracy, They've cracked down on political opponents, they've arrested journalists, um, they are really not responding to complaints from the United States or the EU about their performance on democracy issues. From inside the perspective of that country, 
It is, we are all alone. We have bad neighbor X, we have bad neighbor Y, we have bad neighborhood, uh, <laughs> we have domestic problems, and we, would, we think that we can offer a really valuable strategic partnership with Europe and the United States, but nobody seems to care. And so we're, we're digging in. We've got to protect ourselves. I would argue that in that situation, the position of the US and Europe ought to be, you are a strategically important country. We do want to work with you. We can be a counterbalance to your bad neighbors that try to influence you. And if we did that, it would be a lot more successful engaging them about their democratic performance as well. But without that strategic engagement, we're actually failing mm -hmm. to, to get into the game and talking about democracy. I have nothing against friendly pirates. <laughs> <laughs> engaging with them. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the questions. Thank you for your answers. And thank you for all the thoughts we have, you have shared with us. I hope that I'm bringing a lot to Europe and I hope that everybody's bringing a lot to your jobs where you can maybe help to support democracy in Europe and in the United States. We are, we are waiting a big decision in the United States about the future of the United States and the world. So the Europe is also watching you. <laughs> and with that, before I ask you to, to thanks to our panelists, I would like to in invite Ambassador Mark Green the president of the International Republican Institute to give his final comments. And actually, I, I uh, given the lateness of the day, I won't give my, my full comments, but um, I, I'd like to respond to the richness of the discussion that we've had. It's been uplifting in so many ways, different points of view, and that really is uh, what it's all about and of course we're very thankful to the Atlantic Council for hosting us here and fostering this discussion. It's an interesting day here at the Atlantic Council. We have next door a discussion on the Democratic Republic of Congo. I came from a discussion on the Middle East and of course we've had this wonderful day-long conference on Central and Eastern Europe and the liberal turn of democracy. Why is it that we spend so much time talking about all of these issues, and in particular, Central and Eastern Europe? Well, we do because this region in particular has been in modern history a theater for battle, not so very long ago, with terrible consequences. It's also been a theater for battle for ideas. This has been uh, the theater where some of the greatest successes in modern times in democracy have occurred. And so it matters to all of us a great deal. And we're here because we've seen in recent years some cracks begin to develop and some concerns begin to arise. We see uh, the forces of temptation of authoritarianism in some quarters and with some leaders. As their citizenry face economic challenges, they're tempted to short circuit the process by falling back on authoritarian principles that would stifle debate and maybe in the short term make things easier for them. We've also seen, of course, the exploitation of these cracks and these temptations by Moscow. I know there's been a great deal of discussion today about uh, Moscow's very organized disinformation campaign. Of course, why are they doing it? Well, because they fear democracy. There's one thing that Moscow cannot have, and that's a democracy anywhere near it, because then it breaks Moscow's grip on power, making it very hard for them to justify the crackdowns to their own people. And so that's why we gather and we talk about these very important ideas. I just came back from Georgia, and there was a question about Georgia. I just came back from Georgia where we observed the first round of elections. And um, in Georgia, elections is a very, are a very contentious, highly charged um, series of events, and the discussions and the debates are very spirited indeed. But one of the most uplifting 
parts of my time in Georgia recently was actually the final conversation that I had before I left for the airport. I had a chance to meet with a number of young Georgian political party representatives. And these were individuals, most of them were recent university graduates, and they knew each other in university, and yet they represented different parties, different approaches in a very, again, highly charged atmosphere. And one of the things that they pointed out to me was that in the new generation, of young political party representatives there, they were friends. They talked to each other all the time. In fact, even on election day, while there were protests and threats of protests in other places, these young people were talking to each other and talking about the elections, but also um, reinforcing friendships. And so to me, that's the high note for this region. There are challenges, and we understand that it's not simply the challenges from within, but challenges from within that are being exploited from without. But there is plenty of reason for optimism, and there's plenty of reason for hope, and I see it in that young generation. And so the question, I think, for all of us gathered here today is what can we do as friends of Europe, of friends of democracy, what can we do to reach out and magnify these cross-party friendships? What can we do to reinforce these bonds in the face of highly charged times? So that's, that's the mission for all of us. Thank you, thanks for coming. And again, thanks to the Atlantic Council and the National Endowment for Democracy. Thanks.